Our sermon text is in Isaiah 26, but those of you who know me by now, most of you do understand that I like to tie the two testaments together with some scripture reading just before the sermon. So we'll do that today by first turning to the Old Covenant, the Old Testament in Isaiah 25 for context. Our text is 26, 1 through 6, but we'll begin at 25, 8 to get the context of what's going on in in this part of God's word, 25.8. You'll notice as I begin to read some familiar language that is repeated in the New Testament. 25.8. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be in, said in that day, Behold, This is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For on this mountain the hand of the Lord will rest. And Moab shall be trampled down under him as straw is trampled down for the refuse heap. And he will spread out his hands in their midst as a swimmer reaches out to swim. And he will bring down their pride together with the trickery of their hands, the fortress of the high fort of your walls. He will bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground, down to the dust. And that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For in Yah, the Lord is everlasting strength. For he brings down those who dwell on high. The lofty city, he lays it low. He lays it low to the ground. He brings it down to the dust. The foot shall tread it down. The feet of the poor and the steps of the needy, just that far in Isaiah. Now, if you would keep your finger or a bookmark there, we'll turn over to the New Testament now, to the book of John, very familiar passage to many of you, John chapter 14, one of the most well-loved verses in the New Testament by God's people all around the world in 14.1, but for context, we'll see this parallel between that perfect peace promise in Isaiah, and the fulfillment of it now in Christ, John 14, beginning at verse uh, 23. I misspoke about 14.1 is the context, but we'll go to 23 in that uh, context. John 14, uh, verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the words, word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's God's word for God's people. Now, if you'll turn back to Isaiah 26, we'll begin there. But let's pause briefly and ask the Lord to open our hearts and minds to his word. Father, we do thank you for your word, and we say a hearty amen to all that we've heard. And now... Open the hearts and the minds of your people, and also guide your minister in the proclamation of your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we read in our scripture reading this morning earlier uh, about, before prayer, about the, not only the works of the flesh, but in contradistinction and great contrast to those works of the flesh, the fruit of the Spirit. And those of you, many of you, I'm sure, have memorized Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. And you'll know that that third fruit that is mentioned there is 
peace. Love, joy, then peace. We have heard a lot, I'm sure, in these last, let's say, two weeks about peace on earth and goodwill to men. And that very phraseology is often misinterpreted, not only, sadly, by the world, that's to be expected, but also by, some, by Christians sometimes. What does that mean? Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. What did Christ come to do? Peace of mind, I suppose one reason why it is uh, relished by the world to hear that phrase, peace on earth, this time of year, is because it is in the human heart to seek out peace. We come into this world in turmoil. We come into this world in full-blown rebellion against our God, our Creator. The peace of mind that is often sought by the world, however, as you know, is Uh, sought on a humanistic level, not with no thought to the glory of God in Christ Jesus. Even if peace is achieved, it is often, you'll often hear this time of year that people are praying for world peace. It's not a bad thing to pray for in one sense, and on the other hand, we know that will never be until the second coming of Christ. There will be, never be a day when the entire world, that all the nations of the world are at peace with one another, not until Christ comes. Nonetheless, we do pray that we are instructed in the scriptures to pray for peace to the extent that the people of God can be protected in peaceful circumstances. All that to say that even the greatest achievements toward either continental peace or world peace are temporary. And that drives us to a passage like this, where we we are told by the prophet eight centuries before Christ that we, the covenant people of God, are kept in Christ's perfect peace. Now, I hope you have an outline with you. If not, maybe... A deacon or elder can make sure you do have one. But there are four things to consider here in that outline. Kept in Christ's perfect peace. One, peace in Christ's strong city of salvation. Two, peace through Christ's righteousness. Three, peace through faith in Yah, the Lord. And four, peace through Christ's humiliation of the proud. Let's take those one at a time. As we come to chapter 26 of Isaiah, verse 1, we, are, we see this introduction to this salvation song, and there are several in the book of Isaiah. We read in verse 1, In that day this song will be sung in the land of Judah. And of course, when we read something like that, the careful student of the Bible asks, In what day? Well, if we, that's why we read the context. If you'll read... When we read back a little bit in in chapter 25, we were hearing these promises of coming day when after the captivity, and Isaiah is prophesying even before the captivity begins, but there'll be 70 years of captivity of the people of God, but then they'll be released and sent back to Jerusalem. And in that day, this song will be sung again in the land of Judah. There will be rejoicing in the land of Judah once more. This is a song of hope to sing after the captivity. And even in the days of Isaiah, a song to sing about the coming future deliverance. And this song of hope helped the people of God endure the hardships of captivity, I am sure, as they sang it even in Babylon for those seven decades. That's the historical setting. But of course, when we read the Old Testament, or the New for that matter, but when we read the Old Testament, we're, we're reading about things not only that happened then, but there's already always hints or sometimes strong language that points us forward to the coming Messiah. Eight centuries after this was written, more or less, Christ the King came and established His kingdom in His first coming. And we look back to that. They looked forward to it. We look back to it. But we, like they, also continue to look forward to the second coming of our Savior. When all of the things that are promised here, that perfect peace that is promised here especially, will be uninterrupted forever and ever. 
this song will be sung in the land of Judah. Already that happened after the captivity in those days, and now today the Church of Christ sings this kind of song. There's a, there's a song that uh, t- sings about the perfect peace that we have in Christ in the old Blue Trinity hymnal. Now we get to, that's the introduction to the song. We might say verse 1. Now the second part of verse 1, we get down to the lyrics of this song. What are the lyrics of this song that will be sung? Not only in the halls of Babylon, but after that when they're released from captivity, all the way down until this day. The first verse, we have a strong city. He will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Now, once again, the the good student of the Bible asks, well, who is the we here? We have a strong city. Who is the we then? Who is the we today? Not only that, but how do we, spiritual weaklings, have a strong city? After all, the scriptures tell us that not many mighty are called. We read that in 1 Corinthians 1. You see your calling, brethren. That not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And it goes on to say, God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ Jesus. How can it be that we who in now under the new covenant and after 19 plus centuries of studying God's word since under the, the, the given to the apostles, how can it be that we who know our weakness so well can be called, can say so boastingly, we have a strong city. It doesn't seem that strong on the surface of it. After all, this congregation doesn't strand out as a, a monument to the city of Modesto, does it? A place that everybody knows, a place that everybody is drawn to, as, as a strong defensive city, and that's true, of course, for our churches and our denomination and yours. We're not, we're not well known. We don't have the status of celebrity as a great and strong city, as it were. Then, in those days, the, they were looking forward to that strong city of Jerusalem, that walled city that would stand uh, against her enemies, where the people of God could dwell secure. That was then. Since then, now in Christ, we often sing of the city of Zion of which we are citizens. It is not a strong city physically, as I described it, but it is the strongest city in the world, the city of Zion. Because, not because we are in it, not because we are so strong, but because our king is omnipotent. And so as the song begins to play out, And the stanzas begin to roll out off the pen of the inspired prophet. We see these word pictures that point to the coming Messiah. The strong city with a king inside who will not allow his city to be conquered by the enemies who will assault it. Christ is the strength of the city of God. Christ is the strong, the omnipotent king of Zion. Jerusalem fell eventually, didn't it? Christ said it would. In 70 AD, Jerusalem fell under the Roman Empire. But the city of God will never perish. Its king is omnipotent and no one can undo what Christ has done and is doing and will do. The gates of hell, to quote our Savior himself, will not prevail against his church. They may seem to here and there, now and then. In 21st century California, it may seem that the gates of hell prevail against the church. The church is small. The the followers of the the, uh, the, uh, prince of the power of the air who will be cast into hell are many and outnumber us at least seven to one around the world. But no matter, no one can penetrate the fortress of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In, in John, which we read earlier, previously, in four chapters previous, in John 10, Jesus said it this way, I will give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. 
Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who's given them to me is greater than all, and no one's able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. No one can breach that city wall because Christ is the omnipotent King. We have a strong city, beloved. Then, as we continue to read the description of this city, where more is said about that, Namely, that salvation which has been appointed by the triune God is like walls and bulwarks. Now picture in your mind ancient Jerusalem or some other city. Walls that are many feet thick. Walls that are extremely high. Walls that are so broad that sometimes there are little houses put on top of the wall. Unbreachable we might say. There's the picture of the church under Christ its King. There's a picture of salvation as an impenetrable fortress. And all of this is leading us to the point where we can say, I trust is in the Lord. My mind and heart will be kept in perfect peace because I live in a strong city with bulwarks and thick walls. In our day and age, we might think of a Perhaps the most secure building that we can think of. I suppose it used to be Fort Knox, but they say there's almost nothing there now to, to steal. But the Pentagon, even though it was uh, hit by an airplane, they, uh, and did, they did their best to breach that. You might think of that as perhaps the most secure building, if not in the world, at least in our country. That's the picture here. Of, with us, God's people, covenant people, inside safe and secure, protected. As one song says, safe and secure from all alarms. Not because we are so strong again as the inhabitants of Zion, but that we are kept in perfect peace because of our King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and no one can breach his walls or bulwarks. And so that's the first thing. We are kept in perfect peace, peace in Christ strong city of salvation. That brings us to the second thing. Not only that, but we have peace through Christ's righteousness. You might say that that the second point is the cause and the first point is the effect. The cause is Christ's righteousness. The effect is peace in his strong city. How did we get to become inhabitants and citizens of this particular city. After all, as we said, we were, came into this world with the devil as our master. Even if you were converted very early at life, you came into this world a sinner in need of a savior. And then Christ's righteousness interceded for you so that you could become a citizen no longer of that were of that under, under the authority or a slave to the devil, but now a citizen of Jerusalem, of Zion, the heavenly city. Open the gates, verse 2, that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. And maybe even as we, we read that and say it, open the gates, you can picture these massive gates swinging open for the righteous nation to come and enter in. I usually don't refer to movies in the, uh, in, from the pulpit, but you may be a Lord of the Rings fan. You can picture perhaps those big gates swinging open and here comes the elvish army to save the day in, in through the gates of the city. It's, a, it's, it's uh, that imagery that the ancient world was very familiar with that is kind of somewhat foreign to our way of thinking. The walls, the bulwarks, and now the gates, impenetrable gates, gates by through which you cannot come unless they are opened to you. Who can possibly open the gates into God's kingdom, into God's walled, strong city to let us in? What nation is righteous enough to enter into this marvelous city? You'll see the language, don't you, of verse 2. The righteous nation which keeps the truth can come in. Well, then who can possibly come in? Which nation is Righteous enough to come in. Which nation is, keeps the truth to such a degree that they are, should be allowed to come into this city of God? 
If only the righteous nation may enter that strong city. If only those who keep the truth may enter in. Then woe is us without a substitute, without someone to take us in. And that points us again. Here's another of those word pictures that points us to what Messiah will do. Or for us, looking back to what Messiah has done. It's a picture, if you will, of justification. That in Christ, we are, though sinners, are accounted before the bar of God's justice as righteous because the righteousness of His Son has been imputed to our account. Therefore, since we are counted righteous, now we have become a part of that righteous nation and the gates are open for us to come into that city, that strong city. Thereby we have the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting, that which the supper points us to. By God's grace in Christ, we can say without boasting, we are a holy nation, because that's what God's word says in 1 Peter 2.9. You, beloved people of God, the Christians, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. What's next? A holy nation. Not just a nation, but a holy nation. And what does Isaiah say? That the righteous nation may enter in as the gates are opened to us. Not on our own merit, but because the righteousness of Christ is counted as ours. This also is a picture of our sanctification. Not only our justification, but our sanctification. By sovereign grace, We have been changed and are being changed and will continue to be changed in 2020 to become more and more like the image of Christ the Son. And part of that, the evidence, part of the evidence of that is this from Romans 7.22. We with the apostles say, by God's grace, I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. Or to quote, Chapter 26, if you look at verse 7, just beyond our text, the next, very next verse says, The way of the just is uprightness, almost upright. You weigh the path of the just. God gives us the grace, in other words, to have, as our catechism says, a small beginning of obedience to the Ten Commandments and all the laws of God. And think of verse 8, in the next verse after In our passage 26, the desire of our soul is for your name and for the remembrance of you. With my soul, I've desired for you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me, I will seek you early. When your judgments are in the earth, verse 9, the inhabitants of the world will learn what? Righteousness. This is a part of God's working out his grace in our sanctification so that the gates are open to us and we are counted as a righteous nation. We, he enables us more and more as the decades go by to keep the truth and we are permitted access to, and therefore, as a result, we have peace through Christ's righteousness. That's the second thing. The third thing is in verses 3 and 4. What is it to be kept in perfect peace? It is to have peace through faith. In Yah, the Lord. If peace comes through Christ's righteousness, then how do we get a hold of it? The answer is peace through faith in Yah, the Lord. Verse 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. This is one of those wonderful verses you want to have on your refrigerator. You know, at least that's where we put stuff like that. Or by the front door. It's a great motto for a family, isn't it? Or for an individual, for that matter. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Now, having said that, it, look at it closely. I don't know what, which version you have, but in the New King James, which I'm reading, there are lots of italics here. And those, that's the author's, what the uh, collator's way of letting us know that these are words that are hinted at in the original, but they're not actually there. So I want to read it without the italics to give you a sense of what it says in the abbreviated original Hebrew. It reads like this. You will keep in perfect peace a mind 
stayed because he trusts in you. Well, you can see why the words were added. It's a little choppy, isn't it? My Hebrew professor would have said it's a little wooden that way. But the, the idea is that it could be smoothed out a little bit this way with being very faithful to the Hebrew. You will keep in perfect peace a mind stayed because he trusts in you. You will keep in perfect peace a mind stayed because he trusts in you. Or like this, the steadfast of mind you will keep in peace. Peace, because he trusts in you. By the way, that word perfect peace, I'm sure you've learned from Pastor Sean, that when a word is repeated in the Hebrew language twice or even three times, it's for emphasis. That's what's happening here. It doesn't say perfect peace. It says shalom, shalom. But when you double it, it's double peace, or to the authors took the liberty to call it perfect peace. The steadfast of mind you will keep in peace, peace because he trusts in you. That's so much for the Hebrew lesson. Let's get back to the text. The point is that he keeps those who, who are steadfast in mind. We might say steadfast in their faith. Steadfastness of mind is not something that we can just work up. It is the work of the Spirit in us, for those of us who are in Christ. As if to say, sovereign grace will keep you in peace, beloved brother or sister. On the vertical level, level steadfastness of mind in the midst of turmoil is a gift of God in Christ. Have you seen that? Have you experienced that? Have you ever seen someone who's going, uh, perhaps an, it usually is someone who's fairly elderly in the faith, who've been uh, the Lord's disciple perhaps for decades, and you see them go through, some, through cancer or some other tragedy, and they're solid as a rock. They're, they have that steadfastness of mind after years of being trained by God's grace. You might think of it, an illustration comes to mind of this guarding of the mind, of, of, of give it, the Lord giving us this steadfast of, of mind as a means of granting us this perfect peace, this double peace. Think of a, a father in, with a child in a, in a r- uh, rough neighborhood in Modesto, maybe near downtown, maybe down south Modesto. And the father's there living with his children there, and they're not afraid. They're at peace because they know daddy is there and daddy will protect them from all the bad guys. That's the picture here. There's no credit to us here. It's not that we who have been given the grace of God to to reach some level of steadfastness of mind can now wear a little ribbon on on our lapel. We're passive in this. Trust in Yahweh or trust in the triune God is all of grace by faith, which is also the gift of God. He keeps in peace. We don't keep ourselves with peace of mind. He gives the gift of resting in Christ. Maybe that, you know that song, Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. That peace comes, we read in verse 3, from trust in Yahweh, Jehovah, the triune God. He is constantly defending us. The child, in my illustration, implicitly trusts. The child of God who has become to maturity of faith says, with the, with the hymn writer, no evil can befall me. We, we look to our Father. We know that He's guarding us as children who rely on His grace to protect us. But even that reliance on His grace is a gift that He gives to us. It's so much more, this peace, this shalom, shalom, double shalom, if you will, is so much more than just the absence of war or just the absence of conflict. It's that only comfort in life and in death that comes to the Christian by virtue of the Father's love for us, the Son's love for us, the Holy Spirit's work in us. Double peace. It comes from a trust that our Father in heaven is constantly defending us. Constantly 
preserving us, constantly keeping us. But that perception, that is a fact that cannot be disputed. Well, it can, but it cannot be uh, proven false. He's constantly defending us. That's a fact. But perception of that, that perception of that constant faithfulness comes by faith alone. And it comes for us, it comes and goes sometimes. It's stronger sometimes and weaker at others. The more we grow in grace as the decades roll by, the stronger that perception of his constant faithfulness becomes. Or to quote Calvin, he says it this way. When we trust in God, he never disappoints our hope. I'm going to say that again. That's worth repeating. When we trust in God, he never disappoints our hope. Because he has determined to guard us forever. The psalmist says the, the person who is, has this double peace has it because his mind is stayed on the Lord. Lord, verse 12, look at, look at a parallel passage just down from 6 where we're, we're headed. 26, 12. Lord, you will, estab- you will establish peace for us. You have also done all our works in us. Soli Deo Gloria. There's no room for boasting here. If I have a steadfast mind, if I have a sense of peace in what God is doing in, in my life, and even in the midst of the storm, that's His doing. That's His work working in us. That's His establishing that peace in my heart and mind. And then to think of it beyond just the individual, to think of it on the, the broader level, the universal church, the peace of Christ's church all over the world comes wherever there's peace in the church of Christ as there is in our day and in our country. And we ought not to ever take that for granted just as a side note. The persecuted church in Africa and China are are suffering things we cannot mention from the pulpit. But wherever there is peace in the church of Christ, that comes from God's eternal immutable, unchangeable purposes for his bride and the gates of hell again will never prevail against his church. Calvin again, for in order to prevent godly minds from continual wavering, it's of the highest importance to look to the heavenly decree. In other words, to to summarize what Calvin's saying there, this sense of peace comes in knowing that God has it all worked out. Yes, right now, this, can- this diagnosis of cancer scares me. Yes, right now, this, uh, this fact that I've been disabled and I may not be able to work again and I don't know how I'm going to put food on the table for my family unnerves me. But when I focus on the immutable counsel of God that I know He has every single day of my life worked out, peace comes. It's of highest importance to look to the heavenly decree. God's decree cannot be altered, can it, brothers and sisters? So all who are given the gift of faith in Christ Jesus will, yes, this is not a universal promise in the sense that every single day of 2020, you will have shalom, shalom, double peace. I guarantee it. No, I can't say that to you. But what we can say is now looking to the not yet. The day is coming for some of us sooner than later. Only God knows when peace will be eternal. Will there be any war in heaven? Will there be any conflict there? When there will there be any enemies of God coming after the church? Will there be any persecution of Christ's people in the new heavens and the new earth? Never. For eternity. Remember what Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Your peace in Christ, beloved, before we move on, is not dependent on the world around you. And it's, and if it, because if it was, our steadfastness of mind wavers, doesn't it? We're sinners, we're weak. 
Our steadfastness of mind comes and goes. But his steadfastness of mind never wavers. He rewards the work of his own hands in us. In Yahweh is everlasting strength. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah, the Lord is everlasting strength. That's the only command in the whole passage, by the way. Everything else is just telling you the facts in this song. But here's the only command. Trust in the Lord. You want to have peace of mind in 2020? You want to have double shalom? Trust in the Lord. Because in Yah, the Lord, Jehovah, is everlasting strength. So trust in Him alone forever and ever. Sing with the, song, with the writer, Let me hide myself in Thee, O Rock of Ages. You'll notice some phrases here in, verse, in chapter 25 that are quoted by the apostles. In 25.8 we read, He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Or in verse 9, he will save us. Or we will be glad and rejoice. All these phrases are repeated in the New Testament. So the, the psalmist, of course, being inspired by the same Holy Spirit, is laying out for us uh, aspects of that peace in Christ that we will see also under the new covenant. And so we've seen peace in Christ's song, City of Salvation. Peace through Christ's righteousness, peace through faith in Yah, the Lord, and then fourthly, peace through Christ's humiliation of the proud. Verses 5 and 6. The lofty city is brought down, for he brings down, verse 5, those who dwell on high. The lofty city, he lays it low, he lays it to the ground, low to the ground, he brings it down to the dust. The enemies of our soul, we are promised, will be beaten down by Christ our King. Only He knows how. Only He knows when. We know that ultimately, when Christ returns, all enemies will be trodden under His feet. Every knee shall bow to Him. But until then, one by one, here and there, for example, where is Caesar Augustus? Where is Nero, who did so much damage to the early church? Where is where are Mussolini and Stalin and others who destroyed millions of people who loved the Lord? Or Ho Chi Minh, where are they? They've been beaten down by Christ our King. They've been brought down. They've been brought down to the dust by the power of God. All the way down to dust and ashes to give us his people peace. This is what peace on earth means. Chapter 26, if you skim, you let your eyes skim down to verse 14, it says, They are dead. They will not live. They're deceased. They will not rise. And therefore you have punished and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. How often do you hear those names I just mentioned? Not very often, do you? Their memory has all but perished. But the name of our God continues soli deo gloria not the mighty men of valor but the poor in spirit we read are the rep weapons of his humiliation verse 6 the foot shall tread it down the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy not the mighty ones not the age the angels the archangels gabriel and michael but the feet of the poor the steps of the needy will be those that God uses. The spiritual, in other words, to say the spiritually needy are victorious in Christ. And as a result, there is peace for the city of God. And on the flip side of that coin, humiliation for the city of man. Look at 25.4. But the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. You have been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a, a shade from the heat. All of this to say that in Christ, we are kept in Christ's perfect peace. We have been up until now. We will be in 2020. Not because I say so, 
but because he does. Because peace is a part of being inside Christ's strong city of salvation. Because peace is through Christ's righteousness, which is imputed to your account and mine, brother and sister. Because peace through faith in, comes through faith in Yah the, Yah, the Lord, and he has given you that gift of faith, brother and sister. Because keep peace comes through Christ not only blessing his church, but humiliating the proud and bringing down the enemies of his church. Amen. Let's pray and then we'll move into the Lord's Supper.